again, I'm honored to uh, introduce uh, our second speaker in the session. Um, just let me find my, my notes, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, hi, uh, Kamalika Chadoué. I hope I, I pronounce your name correctly. Um, so, uh, Kamalika is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, University of California, San Diego. Um, she received uh, a bachelor degree at the Computer Science and Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur. I had the pleasure of visiting that amazing institute a year ago, so I'm, I'm just happy uh, to see a um, uh, graduate and a PhD degree from Berkeley. And her, I think, fascinating research um, goes into the depth of privacy in machine learning and kind of following up from uh, um, our previous keynote presentation by Anne Kavokian, um, AI, machine learning and privacy are really becoming um, entangled together and complex and fascinating issues. And um, I'm really looking forward to hear uh, next talk that hopefully will enlighten us about this interesting issue. Thank you. Uh, I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, so you can see my slides. Can you see, can you see it? See the slides? Yeah. Okay, excellent slide. Um, okay, so uh, what I would be talking about today is, you know, as you know, it's, it's kind of a two hour tutorial on differentially private machine learning. And uh, what we'll do is, um, you know, two hours is a very long time. So I'm, I, I'm sure it's okay with the organizers. So after the first hour, we will take a short break. So maybe, you know, like a 10 minute uh, quick break. And, you know, I can take some questions then. And uh, what we will do is I'm, you know, Kobe gave a tutorial on differential privacy already. So what we'll do is we'll give you, I will give you a quick reminder of differential privacy. And then I will talk a bit about, uh, you know, provide an overview about what are some of the common methods and tools that you can use to design differentially private machine learning algorithms. So what we will not do is we will not do uh, get into like a lot of detailed results on the state of the art of differentially private versions of specific problems. The literature right now is absolutely huge, right? It's, uh, you know, it's a huge body of work. And uh, like no tutorial can do justice to that stuff. So what we will do mostly is, you know, talk about some of the common methods, uh, some of the common ideas um, in this area, and then, um, you know, go into it. Okay. Okay. So generally, the idea is that after the end of the tutorial, you should be able to kind of explain the definition of differential privacy, design some basic differentially private machine learning algorithms using standard tools, and, um, you know, basically understand the basic ideas of how things are done. And then I, ref uh, then I think uh, there's a lot of other resources. So, you know, there are a whole bunch of papers that you could read to get into the specifics. Uh, at this point, there are also a bunch of classes um, you know I teach a class on trustworthy machine learning where you know we cover a bunch of stuff on differentially private learning as well and you know there, there are also a whole bunch of other uh, you know classes and other resources online okay I see that there's a question sorry give me a second chat Yes, please do. Please uh, go ahead and write down your questions, uh, preferably in the chat format. And uh, what I will do is I will stop at certain points uh, where it's convenient and uh, take questions. Okay, so let's, uh, sorry, so let's continue. Okay, so um, sorry, let me just uh, get this thing. Okay. So, um, you know, as you know, uh, and as you know, you, you must have seen by now, a lot of data that, uh, you know, AI systems or machine learning algorithms these days uh, deal with are, uh, you know, sensitive data, right? Examples are like medical records and genetic data and then people's behavioral data like search logs. 
And if you don't address, uh, you know, I mean, if you don't, um, if you're not careful in dealing with this data, there can be really bad consequences. And, you know, here is kind of an old example of what happened. So this was, you know, way back in 2006. And um, what happened was that, you know, AOL, back then it was, they had a search engine, you know, not anymore. So what they did was they released uh, search logs. So they wanted to help, uh, you know, researchers work on search. And so, you know, nobody has any data. So they release search logs of, you know, a whole bunch of users. And this is what happens, right? So this is, you know, uh, this came out in the next day's New York Times. So what happened was that it took a reporter just a few hours to hunt down to to basically de-identify some of the people who were in this data, even though they had replaced, uh, you know, I mean, even though they had, uh, you know, they didn't have any names or addresses, they had replaced these names and addresses by numbers like this, right? And so what happened was that, so here is this lady, and so, you know, what, uh, who agreed to be interviewed for this article, what happened was that, you know, the search queries that people give, uh, you know, put into their search engine are quite unique. So for example, you are probably the only person who, you know, I am, pro for example, probably the only person who searches for, let's say, restaurants in San Diego, and then the specific kind of machine learning that I do. And, you know, if you combine that with a couple of other things in my neighborhood, then, you know, I'm the only one who does it, right? And a lot of people who might know a little bit about you may be able to piece this together. Right. And this is kind of what happened over here. Uh, then again, in the Netflix competition, uh, everybody probably knows about the Netflix competition. Uh, what happened is, again, Netflix released a lot of data about, you know, uh, a bunch of movies uh, and users and, you know, how the users had rated certain movies. And what the researchers found was that if you only had two to eight movie ratings and approximate dates for Alice, then you could figure out whether Alice was in the data set or not and her other movies. Rating. So, for example, let's say if Alice uh, writes a blog where she occasionally talks about, you know, some movies that she watches, and if she happened to be in the Netflix data set, then you would be able to find it out, right? And, you know, again, why is this happening? Because people tend to be very unique, you know, especially if you have a high dimensional data about people, they tend to be very unique, right? So, you know, to give you an example, let's say if you see, you know, let's say UCSD, my employer decides to release a salary, an anonymized salary table for their employees. And if you see, and let's say you see a line in this table that goes like this, right? Uh, you know, uh, position faculty, gender female, department CSC, ethnicity city southeast asian uh, then you immediately know who this person is because there's only one person who fits this description and what is more interesting is that you know what is called the linkage information so the information that links me uh, links um, this row in the table to me it's actually on my department's web page right so if you go to my department's web page and i'm sure this is also true for your department you go to my department's web page there is a whole list of faculty with their photos right and the minute you see this list the min that, that's the minute you realize that this table only uniquely links to me right and uh, in in some sense you know it's it's kind of a very simple example but in some sense this example is demonstrative of why privacy is such a big problem and you know it's increasingly becoming such a big problem the reason is that it is becoming increasingly easy to search for and uh, you know to to search for um uh, and find information much more easily, right? So if this was, let's say, the um, let's say the early '90s, to link this row of the table to me, somebody would have to actually physically go to my department. Then they would have to walk around the faculty offices and look at the names, and maybe you know run into the people on the um, in the hallway to figure out that there's only one person who fits these attributes. But now that's not the case anymore, right? So, you know, as uh, information becomes easily, uh, much more easily available, and it, you know, it just become, that's, that's becoming so every minute, uh, what has happened is that this linkage information is also more and more easily available and anonymity is less and less a solution, okay? Okay, so what we learn is that if you simply anonymize data, that can be unsafe. But what about statistics, releasing statistics based on raw data? So here is an example from, you know, a slightly older example. 
where what happened was that um, so this were a group of uh, security researchers and what they did was they were trying to figure out so they we're looking at what are called genome-wide association studies. Now, you know, I'm a computer scientist. I know very little about biology. Uh, to me, this would be something, uh, you know, so to me, a cartoon version of genome-wide association studies looks like this. You have, uh, you know, think about your genome as several bits and, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, so the, there are some specific regions in our genomes called SNPs. So think about these as bits, and um, that combination of bits describes your unique features, right? So I have a certain combination of uh, bits which uh, you know other people don't have, right? And that's what makes me me, right? So what the researchers did was that they looked at these bits or these SNPs, right? And then they looked at correlations between pairs of bits, okay? And then they prepared two tables. So one was for cancer patients. They had some correlation between bits. And the other one was for, you know, a control group of healthy patients. And uh, so typically what people do is, so they, you know, so they, they publish these two tables, right? And typically what people do is they try to find certain patterns in these bits. And, you know, cancer patients or patients who are people who are prone to cancer have certain bits set, which other people don't. And, you know, that's that's what uh, basically disease association studies do, right? They try to figure out what kind of setting of bits is associated with what disease, right? So what they did was, uh, anyway, so what they did was that they had these two tables. And what they found was that based on these two tables, um, and if they had, some idea about, uh, let's say, Alice's DNA, they could figure out if Alice was in one of these data sets. And what is worse is they could figure out if Alice was in the cancer set or she was in the healthy set, right? So what happened over here? Well, so what happened over here was that they had a lot of bits, right? So typically people work with a few thousands of SNPs, right? But these tables were based on not that many people's data. So these tables were based on a few hundred people's data. And again, because, you know, the this kind of uh, sequencing is quite expensive. Um, this is very common for genome-wide association studies. It's very common to work with a few hundred people and uh, more SNPs than there are people. And so now you can imagine what happened, right? So what happened was that you had a lot of equations, not enough variables. So of course you could solve it, right? So, uh, so that's, that's exactly what happened. And what this shows is that not only is simply anonymizing data unsafe, it is also kind of unsafe to release a lot of statistics based on relatively small data sets, right? And in fact, this is a theme that we will see again and again. I'm sure you have seen it in Kobe's talk. And this is a theme that we will see again and again as we go along in this talk as well, right? That uh, overall, there is always a three-way trade-off. There is a three-way trade-off between privacy, accuracy, and data size, right? And by data size, I mean how many people are in the data, right? Sample size or number of subjects, if you will, right? And this comes up again and again in, you know, any kind of application that involves privacy. So you can get any two vertices of this triangle, but not all three, right? So if you, if you have a small, you know, if you have a small number of people, you could either get privacy, but your accuracy will be really bad, or you could get accuracy and you would not have any privacy. But if you have many more people, then, um, you know, if you have a large number of people, then you may be able to achieve both privacy and accuracy. And this is, you know, uh, this is kind of uh, what we also see. So, uh, so a lot of the applications in which privacy is possible are, uh, you know, things like the census, right? Where uh, there are a lot of people, right? Like, um, so, so this is something that, um, you know, that you would want to take away from this talk. Uh, if you want both privacy and accuracy, right, if you want to predict accurately or if you want to figure out, uh, you know, even disease associations accurately, uh, then you would need to have a lot of people in your data. Okay. So now let's look quickly, uh, take a quick look at how to define privacy. So um, for the rest of the talk, 
this is so just to because there there might be a few different privacy settings and you know obviously the setting depends very much on the application uh, for the kind of applications that i will be talking about uh, this is the privacy setup right you have some data set which is private and confidential so as a concrete example think about you know how uh, you know differential privacy is being used in the 2020 us census so as a concrete example think about that as an example right so this private data set is the data that is being gathered by the census agents right and there is some you know some server in the census uh, bureau right uh, you know, the, I, I don't know if there's one or many, but there is. A, so imagine there's some database or some server in the Census Bureau and, you know, your uh, census agents come to your house, they fill out the surveys and the result of these surveys goes into this data set. OK, now out of this private data set, what happens is uh, next to it is a privacy preserving sanitizer. So the sanitizer might, you know, do things like, you know, either uh, do some subsampling or they might, uh, you know, either add some random noise, they might do some subsampling, they might do some deletion, they might do some cleaning up, whatever it is, right? So the sanitizer does a bunch of stuff. Then uh, you have what is called the privacy barrier, right? So, whatever comes out of the sanitizer is for public consumption, right? So think about these as, you know, things that are coming out of the sanitizer, you know, in the census application, um, you know, the sanitizer is a bunch of computer programs, whatever comes out of it would be, you know, the census tables that have been sanitized, right? So, and these could be a lot of different things. So these could be, you know, summary statistics, these could be, you could even try to make a synthetic data set that preserves privacy um, for a lot of this Talk, what we would be talking about is these would be, you know, machine learning models. And these are the things that are going to be released to the public. Okay. Uh, I see some questions and this is indeed a good time. Um, to, yes, that is an excellent point. A lot of data is a relative term. It can be large enough today, but uh, not not tomorrow. That's, uh, that's absolutely true. Um, Yes, so by lot of data, I mean the number of people in your data. So if you want to do more complex tasks, then you would, with both privacy and accuracy, you would need more people, right? So for example, if you want to train a simple linear classifier, you probably don't need that many people to get a private and accurate solution. If you want to train a big deep neural network, then you're going to need more. Okay, there's probably another one. Okay, that is, uh, that's true. Okay, uh, yes, that's an excellent point. Okay, so continuing on, so this is, uh, you know, so this is the, um, this is the setting. And uh, so what kind of properties are we looking for uh, in our sanitizer? Well, the sort of properties that we are looking for, especially, um, you know, with differential privacy, is that aggregate information about a population should be computable, whereas individual information should be protected, right? And it should be protected in a way that is robust to side information, okay? So what do I mean by this? Well, you know, um, one example would be, let's say, if you're trying to use a census table, uh, you know, various census tables to figure out if, um, uh, so, you know, if people in a certain demographic group are having the right educational outcomes, right? So that is kind of aggregate information about a population. That's the sort of thing you hope to be computable. Like that's the sort of thing you should be able to compute based on, you know, even if your data is sanitized, right? But on the other hand, if you want to find out if uh, your neighbor who is in, you know, such and such demographic lives in so and so zip code, uh, if, uh, you know, what is their income, right? That is not the sort of thing you should be able to find out, right? Even if you have some side information about your neighbor, right? That's not the sort of thing you should be able to find out. So that should be protected. Whereas aggregate information about, you know, large groups of people uh, or aggregate information about the entire population, uh, that should be computed. Okay, 
So this is exactly what differentially pri uh, differential privacy does. What it does is that it makes sure that the participation of a single person in the data set does not change the outcome algorithms too much, right? And uh, why is this level, uh, you know, I mean, why is this notion important? Well, uh, you know, participation at a single person level. So why, why is this kind of thing important? Well, it is important because, you know, I mean, usually in, um, people have agency, right? So I can decide whether I want to participate in a data set or not. And uh, if the privacy is offered at the people level, then I can just decide if, you know, if this is enough risk for me or not. And then, you know, based on it, I may participate. Okay. So um, to give you some idea uh, about, uh, again, just to make, uh, to give you some idea about what differential privacy is and what it is not, um, imagine you have an adversary who has some prior knowledge, right? So what does this mean for an adversary, right? Imagine you have an adversary who has some prior knowledge. They know Alice's uh, genetic profile and they know that Alice smokes, right? And suppose um, Alice participated in the study that we spoke about a couple of slides earlier. And uh, the adversary, you know, knows a bit about Alice's genetic profile. They could even get that information by looking at Alice, right? Like sometimes based on people's phenotypes, you can even find out, um, guess some of their genotypes. And um, maybe Alice participated in that study that we spoke about. And, you know, because this adversary knows Alice's genetic profile, they could figure out that, um, uh, Alice uh, has cancer, right? So, and maybe the adversary was the Alice's health insurance. They could figure out that Alice had cancer and then they raised Alice's premium, okay? That would be a violation of differential privacy, right? So that would be a privacy violation because the adversary figured out um, you know, information, sensitive information about Alice because Alice participated in the data set, right? If Alice did not participate in this cancer study, the adversary would not have been able to figure things out, okay? On the other hand, let's say another study came out, uh, let's say from Brazil, right? So let's say, you know, Alice lives in the US, uh, study comes out in Brazil, and the study shows that uh, smoking causes cancer, right? So if you smoke, there's a pretty high chance that when you are older, you're going to get cancer. And the adversary read the study and then they concluded, since they know that Alice smokes, they concluded that, you know, Alice is probably going to develop, you know, either she has cancer or probably she's going to develop cancer sometime in the future. And then they raised Alice's premium, right? That, however, is not really a violation of Alice's privacy by the study, right? Um, so that happened, even if Alice didn't participate in the study, it's just more knowledge about the world came to light. Um, and, you know, the adversary, because they had some prior knowledge about Alice, they concluded that they could raise her uh, health insurance premiums, right? So this study does not violate Alice's privacy, okay? And this is kind of the distinction that differential privacy seeks to make, okay? So uh, this is kind of what differential privacy is getting at. If a person participates in the, uh, if, if the study had um, obeyed differential privacy, which actually this, this study did not, if the study had uh, followed differential privacy, then uh, whether Alice participated in the study or not would not make a difference uh, to any of the outcomes, right? So the adversary, um, you know, the, the first case would not have happened. Okay, so now we are going to, uh, let me, this might be a minute to take a question. Uh, okay, um, so now what we will do is um, we are going to go ahead and talk about how to ensure differential privacy, right? So we talked about, you know, how the participation of a single person does not change uh, outcomes too much. So how do we ensure this? Typically, we ensure this through randomness, right? So what do we do? We make sure that you have, you have some algorithm which, satis which is supposed to satisfy differential privacy. If you, and this algorithm operates on some sensitive data set, right? If you take out one person from the sensitive data, data set and replace them by somebody else, then 
um, the output of the algorithm shouldn't change too much, right? So this algorithm is a random, uh, randomized algorithm. So its output, you know, is has some distribution, right? So since it's a randomized algorithm, uh, if you change your, uh, if you change the input, the distribution would change, right? But what uh, what you want to make sure when you ensure differential privacy is that these distributions would not change too much, okay? Um, so what kind of, so where does this randomness come from, right? This randomness is again, it's a randomized algorithm. So it is added by some, uh, you know, it's added in the algorithmic process. You can either do this by adding noise. You can do this by subsampling. There are many different ways to do this, right? And what does closeness mean? So I said that uh, these would have closed distributions. What closeness means is that likelihood ratios, Right. So, you know, these are uh, these algorithms have some distribution. Uh, the outputs have some distributions. The likelihood ratios at every point is bounded. OK, so more formally, this is what the definition looks like. So if you have data sets D and D prime that differ in for all data sets D and D prime that differ in a single person's value, if A is an epsilon differentially private randomized algorithm, then the likelihood ratio, right? The likelihood ratio of A of D at T versus A of D prime at T, right? Um, this likelihood ratio, uh, or rather here the way I have written is that um, the log of this likelihood ratio, uh, the absolute value of the log of this likelihood ratio is at most epsilon, okay? So basically what this is saying is that this likelihood ratio is always bounded, right? And what does this mean? Uh, it means that somebody who sees T, uh, an adversary who sees this output T, um, you know, their posterior uh, is also bounded, okay? And this, uh, by the way, this particular uh, expression is something called the max divergence. And, you know, again, we'll, we'll come back to this a little bit later in the talk. Okay, uh, there are also various variants of the definition. So for example, you can talk about, you know, things like approximate differential privacy. Here, um, you know, you have a little bit of a fudge factor, right? So if it's an epsilon delta differentially private randomized algorithm, then, um, uh, then um, you know, there is a little bit of uh, a delta fudge factor. So what that tells you is that, um, if you're like, uh, you know, if the probability of something is uh, less than delta, then we don't care. Otherwise, this log likelihood ratio is bounded. And, you know, there are various other relaxations as well. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different properties of differential privacy, which are heavily used in, this, uh, in designing machine learning algorithms. Okay. The first of this is post-processing invariance. So what does post-processing invariance mean? What it means is that, let's say you had that, you know, this was, uh, you know, in the left uh, was our setting, right? You had our private data set, and then you had some differentially private algorithm. And let's say this algorithm gave you some epsilon one delta one privacy, right? And then you took that, the result of that algorithm, and you did a whole bunch of things with it, right? So maybe, uh, you know, you did a whole bunch of things with it, but the important thing is that you never went back to the private data, right? So, you know, maybe an example would be, you know, maybe there was a census table, right? The census released a particular table, uh, I don't know, of populations and their incomes. And then you use that to do some analysis, maybe test some hypothesis, do some economic stuff, you know, you fit it into your own economic model and so on and so forth, right? That result is going to stay, you know, it's going to stay epsilon one delta one differentially private, or, you know, the privacy might improve if you add more noise, but the privacy is never going to go down, right? And this is, you know, as you can imagine, this is a very important property, right? Because if you have, for example, something like the census, and if you release, um, you know, a census table, you do want people to work with the result of the table, and you don't want the privacy to go up, uh, you know, the privacy to go down as a result, right? So that is one thing that differential privacy gives you. And it is a very, you know, it is a very good and strong property. Okay. 
The second property uh, that differential privacy gives you is something called graceful composition, okay? So what does graceful composition mean? Let's say you have a sensitive data set, right? If you have a sensitive data set, and if you keep, um, you know, you have some sensitive data set, and let's say you keep uh, doing stuff based on it. So for example, maybe you have, um, you know, some private data set, you release, uh, let's say the census decides to release, you know, some table uh, which correlates, uh, I don't know, zip code with income, right? Then it will release another table that correlates zip code with race, and then it releases a third table that correlates zip code with something else and so on and so forth, right? And it doesn't also have to be zip code. It, it could be, you know, race with income and so on and so forth, right? And, you know, census does release a lot of tables like that based on the same people's data, right? So let's say that sort of thing happens, okay? Now, the more queries you ask, right, the more stuff you release from a private data, for any, basically for any notion of privacy, right? The more you use the same private data set, um, for any notion of privacy, your privacy would slowly break down, right? But in differential privacy, a very interesting property is that it breaks down slowly. It doesn't break down all of a sudden. It's not like I release one thing and tomorrow I release something else and all the privacy is gone, right? It breaks down slowly. So if each release is epsilon i delta i, then the total release is, you know, the sum over epsilon i is delta i's. And uh, so this is called graceful composition. Better bounds are also possible, uh, but then, uh, you know, better bounds are also possible and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, right? And this is very important because a lot of machine learning algorithms are iterative algorithms. You calculate something based on a data set, then you calculate another parameter, then you maybe calculate something else. And this graceful composition property is very helpful, okay? Okay, so let's talk very briefly about how to achieve differential privacy. Um, there are many, there are uh, quite a few tools for achieving differential uh, privacy uh, and, and basically for any sort of differential privacy algorithm design, okay? And uh, what we will do is, uh, what I will do is I will kind of talk about two basic tools which are used the most often in machine learning. There are you know, many others and they're also used quite a bit, but these are kind of the two basic things that are used in machine, machine learning, okay? The first is the global privacy method, uh, sorry, the global sensitivity method. And the second is the exponential mechanism. So the global sensitivity method is the one that is the most common, okay? So what is the global sensitivity method? The, suppose you're given some function f and a sensitive data set d, your goal is to find a differentially private approximation to f of d, right? So notice that if you just release f of d, it won't really be private because, um, you know, because it's a deterministic function, right? We need a randomized, uh, you know, we need a randomized output, right? A differentially private mechanism is a, a randomized mechanism, okay? So an example of this kind of F of D might be, you know, uh, in machine learning problems, we'll talk about uh, things like, you know, classifiers and so on. But a very simple example could be something like the mean of points in D. Okay. So what does the global sensitivity method do? The distance between D and D prime uh, define, so you define a distance between D and D prime, your data sets D and D prime is the number of records or the number of people that D and D prime differ in. And the global sensitivity of F is defined as the absolute value of the difference between F of D and F of D prime for um, maximum absolute value of the difference for where D and D prime differ in one person's value. Right, so you look at all pairs D and D prime that differ in a single person's value. You look at the absolute difference F of D minus F of D prime and you take a maximum over all such D and D primes, okay? So that is your global sensitivity. And um, so there are a couple of different versions of the global sensitivity mechanism. And you know, the most uh, common one is what is called the Laplace mechanism. 
Here, what you do is, uh, you know, remember we defined the global sensitivity. You output the function value, so f of d plus z, where z is a Laplace random variable. Uh, and uh, so z is distributed as the global sensitivity divided by epsilon times um, a Laplace random variable with parameters 0 and 1. Okay, so the Laplace random variable, I, I know it's not the most common distribution, but this is kind of what it looks like, right? So I plotted the PDF of this variable and, you know, it, uh, it, and this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, but essentially, approximately what you kind of need to know over here is the Z will have standard deviation that is approximately uh, S of F, this global sensitivity divided by epsilon. Okay, so that's uh, so that's that's the kind of noise you add, and what you can probably show is that this result is epsilon differentially private. Okay, uh, there is also the Gaussian mechanism. In the Gaussian mechanism, what happens is so the Gaussian mechanism will not give you epsilon differential privacy. Uh, you need uh, you're going to have an epsilon delta. Right, and um, the, the Gaussian mechanism, you add Gaussian noise, and uh, so you know this, these numbers come out of a lot of calculations involving the problem, you know, involving the probability density functions. So there, you would add Gaussian random noise, Gaussian random noise with, um, you know, so your z would be uh, global sensitivity divided by epsilon times a normal with mean zero and variance twice log of 1.25 over delta. Again, these little numbers come out from, you know, the calculations with the Gaussian PDF. But if you add this kind of noise, then the result will be epsilon delta differentially private. Okay, and given an epsilon and delta, you can find this, uh, you know, these standard deviation values, okay? So to give you um, a quick example, uh, coming back to our example of the mean, suppose what you want to do is uh, your, um, each record is a scalar in zero to one is a number between zero and one. And what you want to do is you want to release a differentially private approximation to the mean of these numbers. So if you think about it uh, carefully, the global sensitivity of this function is going to be one over n, right? Where n is the number of records. And that's because each each number can be between zero and one. So if you change one person's value, the mean could change by one over the number of people. And what the Laplace mechanism would do, uh, if you wanted to get epsilon differential privacy, you would output the actual mean plus z, where z would be one over n epsilon times a Laplace random variable, okay? So that would be uh, what the Laplace mechanism looked like, okay? So I want to point out one, um, you know, one interesting thing over here, right? Remember how we talked about this privacy accuracy sample size trade-off, and you see it over here. So if your n is really large, then your z has really small standard deviation, right? So here, you know, approximately the standard deviation of z is one over uh, n epsilon, right? So if your n is very large, your z has really low standard deviation, right? And again, remember that low epsilon here means high privacy, right? So your accuracy is kind of the standard deviation of Z, right? And so, you know, uh, sorry, accuracy is like inversely related to the standard deviation of Z, right? So if Z has very high standard deviation, then, um, you know, then, uh, then the, um, then, then your accuracy is really low, right? Because, you know, your random variable is really spread out. Whereas if Z has low standard deviation, then your accuracy is really high, right? So notice that if you have high privacy, then your epsilon is very small, uh, then, you know, which leads to a growth in Z standard deviation, right? You lose, uh, so if you keep N fixed and you increase privacy, you're going to lose inaccuracy. If you keep, um, epsilon fix and increase n, right? If you increase your data size, then your standard deviation goes down, so you gain in accuracy, right? So you do see this uh, privacy accuracy data size trade-off. Uh, if your data size is large, you could get both pri high privacy and high accuracy, but if your n is low, then uh, you can't get both of these together, okay? Uh, and again, you know, we will see this again and again. So I see that there may be a question. Let me take a quick look. 
Um, ah, excellent. So there's an excellent question from Iran, which says that how do we scale differential privacy in cases where each individual has more than one record or one data point in the data? That's an absolutely excellent question. Um, if the number of data points contributed by one individual is bounded, then you can take the maximum number. And, you know, to be honest, that's what most people do. There isn't a very good solution for when this could be really large. So um, you could either randomly delete some of the data points co co uh, corresponding to an individual uh, to bring down the sensitivity. If it's very unbalanced, you could delete some of them um, randomly. Uh, but uh, that, that is actually one of the open questions, uh, you know, like dealing with this nicely and cleanly is one of the open questions in differential privacy. Excellent question. Okay. Um, okay, that's excellent question. Okay, so uh, that was the example of the mean. Okay, so to continue, um, we've talked about the global sensitivity method, which has two variants, Laplace and Gaussian. Uh, there is also the exponential. Uh, the second kind of thing that we use quite a bit in machine learning is the exponential mechanism. Okay. So what does the exponential mechanism do? What it does is that given a function, uh, it is a function of some, you know, some parameter W and a sensitive data set D, what it does is that it tries to find a differentially private uh, approximation to uh, the R max, right? So the W that maximizes this F of W and D. Right. So here, you know, you have some function that you wish to let's just say maximize and um, uh, but this function depends on sensitive data. Right. So the maximum will also depend on exactly what the sensitive data set is. And what this does is it gives you an approximate maximum. Right. And this kind of thing is, in fact, um, you know, this is a kind of thing is, in fact, quite a bit used in machine learning because, uh, you know, um, in machine learning, as you will see, we are often solving these kinds of, you know, these kinds of optimization problems that depend on data. Right. So an example that fits right into machine learning would be let's say you had some sort of a classifier right like, or some more, some machine learning model right and f of w and d could be how accurate this classifier is on a data set d right you have some classifier you want to find out um, you know uh, f of wd is the accuracy of this classifier on a data set d and you want to find out the most accurate classifier right and that fits right into this problem setting okay so what does the exponential mechanism do? What it does is the following. It says that suppose for any classifier, for any W, uh, F of D and F of D prime, the gap between them differ in at most S when D and D prime differ in one record. So, you know, if you were talking about accuracy, if you change one, one person's value, one record, then, you know, it would differ by uh, one over the number of points in that data set, right? So if that is the case, and that is true for a lot of these kinds of functions f's, then you can sample w from this following density, right? So the sample w or distribution, right? You sample w uh, where, uh, you know, for a particular w, the p of w is proportional to e to the epsilon f of w d divided by twice s, right? And uh, if you do that, then you're going to get epsilon differential privacy. Okay, so if you look at this a little bit closely, what you find out is that the uh, the mode of this distribution that you're sampling W from, the mode is actually the true R max, right? So normally what you would do is in a non-private way, you would just output the R max. Now what you are doing is you are sampling from Ws that uh, could have been the R max uh, and the higher uh, you know f of wd is higher your probability so you're a little bit spread out around the moon right so that's kind of what you're doing and uh, your uh, how spread out you are depends on s right how spread out you are depends on you know um, when you change one person's value how much does f f of w uh, d change right so that's kind of determines how spread out you are okay and 
A very simple example of where this could be used in machine learning is uh, in parameter tuning. So very often what happens is, you know, machine learning algorithms have all kinds of parameters, right? So very often what happens is, um, you know, so how do you figure out what parameter is best for your data? Well, uh, the way we do it is through something called holdout validation, right? And this is like, you know, uh, a very common thing that uh, people do in um, in machine learning you get let's say k classifiers and you get some validation data set d and you want to find the classifier which has highest accuracy on d right so you want to output that classifier and uh, what you would uh, do here is uh, you know again f of wd is the class Classification accuracy of W and D. And for any W, uh, you know, since this is the accuracy, uh, any D and D prime that differ by one record, you can, uh, you, you know, the, the gap between F of W D and F of W D prime would be one over the size of D. And then you can use the exponential mechanism. Uh, you know, if you have K classifiers W1 to WK, you can use the exponential mechanisms which will output WI with probability proportional to uh, epsilon times the size of D times F of WID divided by two, right? So this is what the exponential mechanism would do. And this would be epsilon differentially private. Okay, so this is an example where the exponential mechanism is used and, uh, you know, used quite a lot. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so this was kind of the first part of the talk and maybe I'll stop to take uh, some questions if there are any. What we did was we looked at, you know, we revised some basics of differential privacy uh, and then we looked at a couple of basic differential privacy algorithm design tools, which we will be using, um, you know, for designing differential privacy, uh, differentially private machine learning. Uh, algorithms and you know in particular uh, the two tools that we will need is one would be the global sensitivity method and there are two variants of it and also the exponential mechanism okay i see that there may be a question in the chat okay so in that case what i will do is i will Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So, if there are no more questions, I will switch to the next part of the talk. Okay. So, in the next part of the talk, what we will do is we will talk uh, a little bit about the basics of machine learning. And uh, then we will talk about, start talking about how to design differentially private machine learning algorithms. And um, uh, a little bit into the talk, we will do, um, maybe in another 10 to 15 minutes, we will do a short five minute break. Okay. Okay. So what is machine learning? So, you know, very, 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 very broadly speaking, Machine learning is a way to use data to learn to make better, better predictions, right? So an example would be, you know, uh, you know, examples that we all see around us would be something like a recommendation system, where what is happening is that uh, they're using the data, right? So they're using uh, what people see. So Netflix collects a lot of data about what people see and what they like, and they are using the data that they collected about, you know, what people see and what they like, to make predictions, right? So, the, so they, you know, offer you recommendations on what you might want to watch, okay? Another example, you know, very common example is something like uh, spam detection, right? So spam detection is how to use data. Uh, you know, again, uh, you know, you, you see these spam filters, right? So where, you know, when you have an email, uh, kind of Google marks it as spam or not. And the way they are doing it is because they have data, right? Like they have a whole bunch of emails that have been labeled spam or not. And then they are, um, you know, they are uh, learning some rule that, you know, this is a spam that is not. And if the data were to change, their predictions would change, right? So they are using data to learn to make better predictions, okay? So 
what what do we learn from this well what we learn from this is that making predictions is kind of the very basic problem in machine learning right so it's it's one of the you know really basic problems in machine learning and what we will be talking about um, you know mostly throughout this talk is the basic problem in machine learning uh, you know kind of the basic, basic uh, prediction problem, which is classification. Okay, so what is classification? In classification, what happens is that you are given a whole bunch of labels data, right? So label data are, you know, XI, YI pairs, where XIs are what are called feature vectors, and YIs are what are called labels, right? Uh, so an example would be, you know, in the spam prediction problem that we just talked about, your X size could be emails, right? Some feature vectors gotten that you um, get out of emails and Y eyes would be spam on not. And the important thing here is that your Y eyes are typically discrete, right? In machine learning, we look at, you know, uh, cl in classification problems, Y eyes are discrete. In regression problems, they're continuous. But in machine learning, we mostly look at classification problems. So these Y eyes are discrete. And your goal is to find a prediction rule that can predict Y values for Xs that are similar but are unseen, right? So, you know, if you have a bunch of spam, uh, you know, if you have a bunch of emails that you have labeled as spam or not, well, you know, you know what the labels are, right? So uh, predicting well on what you have seen is, you know, well and good. But what you really want to do is to predict on new spam that would come, right? Like new emails that come to your inbox. What you want to do is they're, you know, they're probably similar to your old emails. And what you want to do is you want to predict if those are spam or not, right? So what we care about is predicting Y values for unseen X. Um, an example of such a problem, you know, which we might want to study in the context of privacy would be something like uh, a flu test, right? So, you know, so for example, um, I'm sure there's a COVID version of this too, but uh, this was, um, you know, a Microsoft app. Um, at the time of the swine flu. And what happened was that this was one of these uh, kind of diagnose yourself things, right? So you put in some of your symptoms. If you clicked on, you know, take flu self-assessment, what would happen is that they would ask you various questions about, oh, what is your temperature? Have you had a cough and so on, right? And for how many days? And then it would predict whether you would have flu or not. And this was done in a da completely data-driven manner based on patient symptoms, right? So what happened was that that they had some kind of prediction rule, right? They had a lot of data about patients and along with labels about whether these patients had flu or not. And uh, based on this data, what they did was they um, came up with this kind of prediction rule, right? So how does this work? Well, uh, you know, they had a lot of patients and for each of these patients, they had, you know, attributes like, you know, whether this person has a sore throat, do they have a fever? What is their temperature? And then they had, um, you know, kind of a label, what we call the label, right? Whether, you know, the, this label could be yes or no, does this person have flu or did they not, right? And then what they would do is they would take these attributes and they would convert them into numerical values, right? So, you know, uh, yes or no becomes, you know, a zero one value. Uh, the temperature would, would become maybe a number. And then the label would be converted into some, you know, plus or minus. And then what would happen is they would get, this would give them training data. So training data would be a whole bunch of labeled vectors that would go into a classification algorithm and out came a prediction rule, right? So this prediction rule would be, you know, maybe it would be, you know, the simplest thing is a linear classifier where what you have is some kind of a hyperplane. On one side of the hyperplane, you say flu, and if the patient lies on the other side, then you say no flu, right? So that would be an example of a classifier. And this entire process of you know taking the training data feeding it into an algorithm and you know how it comes a classifier this entire process is called training right and you know this is kind of um, you know one of the fundamental things that we do in machine learning okay and once you have a classified uh, you also have to evaluate it and the way people evaluate it is through, uh, you know, that process is called testing. So what happens is once you have your classifier, you have unseen test data, right? 
this is data that you did not use for training. This is data that you have never seen before. And, you know, kind of the golden rule of machine learning is that training and test data should always be separate, right? So this is data that you haven't seen before. You have this test data. This goes into a classifier and uh, out comes a prediction. And what you, and what we usually do is, you know, we check to see, you know, how accurate this prediction is, right? Um, and this is called the testing process. Okay. Okay. So uh, um, again, what we would be doing is, you know, kind of we would be looking at classification and uh, we talked about this kind of training and testing process. Okay. So what are the goals of classification? Okay. Remember in classification, what happens is that, you know, we are getting, you know, at training time, we are getting a bunch of, uh, you know, labeled vectors. Okay. But these label vectors in machine learning, what we do is we assume that these label vectors come from some sort of distribution over labeled examples, right? So, you know, uh, there, there was some underlying distribution over, you know, patients and healthy people, and these label vectors come from this distribution. And, um, you know, remember we talked about that we don't necessarily care about predicting correctly on the training examples. We care about predicting correctly on unseen examples, right? And the way we model this process, you know, the, is that what we want is there's some distribution P over labeled examples. And what we want to do is we want to find the classifier, let's call it F uh, sub W, that separates these pluses from the minuses for most points from P, right? So we, so the point here is that we don't just care about doing well on the training data. What we care about is that we do well with respect to this distribution, right? And uh, what people have seen over the years and, you know, this is, you know, what is um, generally called the Occam's razor principle, that um, what we want to do is we want to find a simple model that would fit the training samples well, right? So it's not just enough to um, find a model that fits all the training samples, but we want to find a, a relatively simple model that will fit the training samples well, okay? So, the way we do this at machine learning is we uh, do something called regularized. This is done through something called regularized empirical risk minimization. So what happens here is we are given label data, X, I, Y, I. So we have a whole bunch of X, I, Y, I pairs. These are our training data. And what we do is we find a prediction rule, F sub W, that minimizes uh, the following quantity, okay? So what are these quantities? So if you look at this closely, there are two terms, right? So the first term is, uh, um, actually, let me look at the second term before. So first, first, let's look at the second term. The second term is one over N, where N is the size of the training data. Then you are summing over I going from one to N, uh, a function L of FW of XI. So FW of XI is the prediction that is made by FW on XI, right? And YI, right? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to, you have some loss, right? So you have some loss function. And if your prediction um, that F makes on XI does not agree with YI, then this loss function would be high, right? And if the prediction agrees, then the loss function is low, right? So this is some kind of a training loss function, right? Uh, and this is the, uh, and so what the second term does is, uh, you know, it's called a risk term. It measures the training risk, okay? What the first term does, and now let's go back to the first term. So the first term is something called the regularizer. And what it does is if your, mo if your model or if your uh, prediction rule FW is very complex, then your first term is very high. Right. So this is called, you know, in machine learning language, this is something called the regularizer. And what this does is that it measures model complexity. Right. So if your model is very complex, then this term is very high. And this penal and since we are minimizing the sum of these two terms, what you are doing is that you are penalizing really complex models. Right. You're really penalizing really complex models and you're penalizing um, making bad predictions. Right. So and you are penalizing the sum of these two. 
okay? So this is uh, what is called a regularized empirical risk minimization. And the way that you um, get to, you know, models that general uh, you know that uh, that have high uh, that may have high test accuracy or that may have high accuracy on your distribution is by solving this kind of regularized empirical risk minimization problems okay let's look at a quick example maybe a uh, linear classification uh, here you are given here your prediction um, would be something like your fu prediction function is um, you know you have uh, your w is a vector your prediction function is sine of w transpose x right so let's say your labels are plus minus one your prediction is sine of w transpose x and here your problem becomes you know you're given la label data x i y i a common regularizer is what is called the L2 regularizer and uh, that would be half of uh, lambda norm of W square so W is a vector it's a norm of this vector square uh, what this is doing is it's penalizing um, vectors which have high L2 norm and your risk is a uh, training loss so this uh, you know there is this loss function L this is a function of W transpose Xi and uh, Yi right so if your W transpose was xi is close to, uh, you know, it, it has the right sign as yi, then uh, this loss is low, whereas if it has a different sign, then this loss is high. Okay. And some examples of this is, you know, when your that loss function L is what is called the hinge loss, then uh, this optimizer is, uh, you know, what is called support vector machine. So you may have heard of this term before. When your risk is what is called the logistic loss, then your optimizer is what is called logistic regression. Okay, and uh, and so what you do in machine learning is you try to minimize this uh, kind of regularized uh, empirical loss. Okay. And in, uh, so when we want to do differentially private machine learning, what we want to do is we want to solve this kind of empirical risk minimization problem with privacy. Right. So what does that entail? Uh, let's say if you are if you want to find a linear classifier with privacy, uh, you have your label data points X, I, Y, I. You want to find a vector W that is private in the sense that it is differentially private with respect to your training data. And it also is accurate in the sense that it will approximately minimize the regularized risk. Okay, so that is uh, kind of what you're hoping to do uh, in this kind of ERM with privacy. So since it's, uh, I guess uh, my time is nine o'clock. So maybe what we could do is uh, we could take a five minute break. And when we come back, I could, um, you know, we can talk about how this is, uh, you know, how this is actually done. Is that, uh, does that sound good? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's great. Uh, I encourage all the attendees to to uh, also uh, post some questions. Um, I think now we're getting into um, beyond the introductions and into the really um, uh, new stuff. Yes. Um, so let's let's take five minutes and in uh, Israel time uh, seven o five. Let's say uh, we'll uh, we'll get back here. Thank you. Okay. okay. See you. Okay, great. I hope everybody has some uh, some sort of a drink. Um, uh, an yes. evening cocktail. Or, <laughs> yeah. Or a I guess for you guys, it's an evening cocktails, right? For us. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll try to make it uh, entertaining. Okay. There's nothing more entertaining than differential privacy for <laughs> machine so I don't think there's going to be any problem. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Uh, oh, I probably stopped sharing. I don't. Uh, okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Section two. Okay, excellent. So we uh, were talking about now, so now we are kind of coming to the meat of the things. So we were talking about um, how to do ERM with 
privacy, right? So here, what is going on is we are given label data. Our goal is to find, uh, you know, if you are looking at linear classification, um, normally we would find a vector that approximately minimizes, the uh, that minimizes the regularized, uh, regularized risk. Uh, but the regularized um, uh, risk depends on the training data. So what we want to do is we want to find something that is differentially private uh, with respect to the training data and approximately max, uh, minimizes the regularized risk, okay? So why is it not private by default? Well, um, you know, what could happen is um, very often when you look at these uh, minimizers of these kinds of risks, well, these, uh, the results might differ quite a bit depending on the data set, right? So in particular, if you have, uh, you know, if you have your private data set D, your, uh, your minimizer could be this W star. And if you move this plus, which has like a blue um, circle around it, if you move it from here to there, the result might rotate quite a bit. Right. And so what could happen is this might enable an adversary to tell whether the data set was, uh, you know, D or the data set was D prime. And as a result, by default, the CRM will not be private. Right. However, we can get to learning that is private in the sense that we can do it in a privacy preserving way. And if you think about the goals of learning, right? The goals of learning is to predict well with respect to this distribution. Um, it's not incompatible with privacy, in fact, right? It's in fact very compatible with good learning, right? Because if you have a good machine learning algorithm, that would generalize to the population distribution, right? So if you have, ideally what we are hoping to do is to get a, um, a classifier that works well on the distribution, right? So we are really looking for an aggregate uh, quantity and it is not, uh, in you know, it is very much compatible with privacy, right? And in fact, um, even before, uh, you know, the concept of differential privacy came out, people can, people have been talking about in the machine learning literature, they've been talking about, you know, there are various notions of, you know, stable predictions or stable classifiers. And it's been known that these sort of stable algorithms do generalize. Uh, you know, they, they do generalize to the entire distribution. And in fact, um, you know, there are alternative interpretations of differential privacy uh, as a form of stability, and as a form of algorithmic stability that also implies generalization, right? So asymptotically, so if you're in, you know, if you have a lot and lot and lot of data, asymptotically, privacy does imply generalization, right? Like, uh, in fact, uh, if something is differentially private, it, uh, you know, in, in, and also has some other properties, you can get generalization. So it does um, give you generalization asymptotically, right? Uh, however, um, so asymptotically, if you, if this data size is not a problem, privacy should not get in the way of generalization, right? We could do both privacy and learning uh, well. Right. However, we always learn with finite training samples. Right. And in fact, the challenge is to learn with, uh, you know, learn well with relatively few training samples. So the real question is how to manage. Uh, so in learning, the real question is how to manage this kind of privacy accuracy sample size trade off with a uh, relatively finite ten. OK. Okay, so coming back to, um, you know, ERM, this is our kind of ERM problem, right? What we want to do, regularize the ERM problem rather, what we want to do is we want to find a W star that minimizes the loss plus a regularization term. And we want to do this in a differentially private manner, right? So how can we do this in a differentially private manner? Um, if your function is convex, which is, you know, for linear classification, which is the case for more complex things like deep learning, that is not the case. So if your function is, you know, if this regularized risk is convex in, uh, uh, is a convex function in W, then you can, uh, you know, then, then there are, um, 
you know, then there are several things that you can do. So there are three steps in this process. You can read in the data, you read in the data, you form the objective function, and then you do the minimization. And what you can do is, especially when we are looking at the convex um, optimization, we can try to introduce privacy in each of these steps, okay? So if you are introducing privacy, when you are reading in the data, what you get is input perturbation. And you can actually get very strong privacy in the process. Uh, if you are, um, you know, introducing privacy in the process of forming the objective uh, function, that is uh, what is called objective perturbation. Then if you are, um, if you want to, um, you know, introduce privacy uh, after you perform the minimization, then what you get is output perturbations, right? And uh, these are kind of, uh, so if you were to look at, uh, look, look at ERM as a whole, and if you were to get, uh, you know, if you were to do this privately as a whole, um, for convex optimization, uh, particularly for convex optimization, then these are the three things you can do, and these will give you three algorithms. Okay, and next what I will do is I will tell you a little bit about how to do each of these. Okay, okay. So, uh, so here are our options, right? So let's say if you are doing input perturbation, um, this is what things would look like. You have your own data. You perturb it so that you ensure privacy, after per, uh, that's your privacy barrier. After perturbation, it goes into a sanitized uh, database, right? And then up out comes, a, uh, you know, then, you know, the sanitized database does some, uh, you know, uh, the sanitized database has already private data. You use some kind of algorithm, which doesn't need to be private because you're operating on private data and you get a classifier, right? So this is what is called input perturbations, okay? So you have a private database. Um, so, so sorry. So that is what is called in. Uh, sorry, this was what is called input perturbations. Okay. Um, okay. And so what we are going to do. The other thing you could do also is you could take your input data. They feed into a private database. You do some differentially private pre-processing, right? And then you have a private a privacy barrier and what comes out is sanitized and you can do non-private learning on top of this, right? So these are two ways to possibly do input perturbation. And typically what people do is they look at the second way, okay? So, sorry, so uh, these animations are a little bit messed up. So this is what we are going to do for input perturbation, okay? Now, the other thing you could do is you have your private database, you do some non-private pre-processing, and you form kind of a private, uh, you know, optimization function. And, um, and then you have your privacy barrier, and then, you know, out of the privacy barrier comes out your objective, right? So that would be objective perturbation. And then the other option is maybe you do this non-private optimization, uh, non-private optimization function, you get out your W star, and then you do some noise addition or randomization, and then comes your output function out of the privacy barrier, that would be your output perturbation, okay? So these are the various options that we could do, okay? So let's talk about uh, some of these options, right? So these were, you know, there are various places into which you can inject privacy. So let's talk about, let's look at some of these options in um, a little bit more um, detail, okay? So um, the first uh, one is, you know, the, the more, you know, this is, you know, one of the more common ones that people do. You get your input data, you do some input perturbations, there is a privacy barrier, and then this gets to a sanitized database, okay? So this is what is called local privacy. And uh, so you have your sanitized database, then you have some kind of non-private learning algorithm which operates on the private data, and you get some kind of decision rules, okay? Uh, 
So this is what is called local privacy. And, uh, you know, and this is inspired by uh, a very classical technique called randomized response, right? And this was back in 1965. Uh, and then uh, they were using this kind of randomized response for uh, not for learning, but for, you know, estimating, um, you know, sensitive um, properties about population. So for example, uh, one example would be what is the fraction of the population that uses some kind of an illegal drug, right? And there what you would do is you would just, you know, uh, toss a coin. So, you know, maybe you use, I don't know, maybe you use um, cocaine or not, you toss a coin and then, um, you know, if the coin comes up heads, you write down the true answer. If the coin comes up tails, then you flip your answer. Uh, right and then uh, with some probability and then you um, so that that was that's kind of randomized response however you can think about a version of uh, you know you can think about some version of this for learning and uh, this interactive version can be minimax optimal okay so what you are doing here is you are adding noise to the input data so the way this would come out is you would add noise to the input data um, and the advantage is, is that this is very easy to implement, results in reusable sanitized data set. Uh, however, the disadvantage of this is that you end up adding a lot of noise. Okay. And in fact, this is one of the things that, you know, or some variant of it is one of the things that people actually use, especially um, a lot of industrial applications, right? So things like Apple's, um, you know, all of Apple's privacy is basically input perturbation and local privacy, where what you are doing is you take somebody's data, you add a lot of noise um, to make it private, and then um, and then you just uh, kind of uh, send this over, right? So this is uh, input perturbation, and then you have this really super noisy data, and you learn with uh, you know learn on this super noisy data. Okay, so this is actually uh, what Apple uses for, um, they use it for mostly for statistics, but this is also very similar to what Google uses for federated learning, right? So they do input perturbation, um, some, some version of it, you know, they use a slightly more complicated interactive version of it. Okay, uh, and this gives you very strong privacy. Okay, the more, um, so, so that that was, that is uh, input perturbation. Okay. So the next up is what is called output perturbation. So in output perturbation, remember what you were doing is your private data goes into the database. You do some non-private pre-processing. You do a non-private optimization process. Uh, the W star, right? So this is uh, you know you minimize the <laughs> regularized empirical risk, and then you add noise or do some sort of randomization uh, to get, let's say, a classifier, and that goes across the privacy barrier, right? So here what you're doing is you're computing the minimizer and then adding noise. And here the advantage is that, you know, you can use your non-private optimization algorithm. Right. So because there are a lot of very, uh, you know, highly sophisticated optimization algorithms, you can use these non private versions of these optimization algorithms and then you can just add noise. OK, uh, here the. The hard thing is that the trade off is that the noise that you are adding will depend on the sensitivity of this uh, minim minimizer, right? So some minimizer, uh, some minimizers could be very sensitive. If one data point changes, it could change quite a bit. Um, some minimizers are less sensitive. Okay, uh, so that is output perturbation, and finally you have objective perturbation so in objective perturbation what you do is you do some non-private you know your data again goes into the sensitive uh, private database you do some non-private pre-processing and then you can uh, you know you um, you have get up uh, you know you get a private objective term and then you can minimize this objective so one way you can do this is you can add a random term to the objective right the way you to do, uh, do it is you can do a random term to the objective um, so what you do is you know you take your objective and then you add um, a random linear term right uh, and then you um, minimize this entire sum 
the other thing you could do is you could do a randomized approximation of the entire objective, right? So your objective now becomes a randomized function and then, uh, then you do this approximation. And here the randomness that you would add would depend on the sensitivity properties of the objective, okay? So, uh, so those were uh, kind of the three ways to do it. Oh, uh, there may be a question, let me quickly check. Ah, so what Iran is asking is that, um, is there a specific class of applications that can benefit or harm for input perturbations? That is a very interesting question. So, you know, um, my so the harm in input perturbation is that you end up adding a lot of noise. So if you add a lot of noise, you lose even more accuracy, right? So the privacy accuracy data size trade-off uh, gets worse, okay? The benefit is that you get stronger privacy, right? So for example, let's say if Google is using input perturbation, they don't even need to collect the raw data, right? And this can have several benefits. So one benefit of this would be, let's say if Google is subpoenaed, right, for your data, then they don't need to, uh, you know, if Google ever gets subpoenaed for your data, then they don't need to, um, you know, they they can just you know they they don't have the liability right they they can say that look we only have the privatized version of the data so we can give you the privatized version of the data but we don't have the raw data okay the other thing that sometimes happens in you know kind of large uh, corporations is sometimes if you can collect the data for one purpose and then later use it for something else right here if you are collecting a sensitive version of the data uh, then you can't, you know, so for example, it might happen that, you know, initially you may collect the data for, uh, to detect if your uh, code has some bugs, right? So you might have some very specific kinds of errors, uh, you know, you, let's say you collect the data, but maybe later you use it to predict something about your users that they might find sensitive. Right. And uh, that sort of thing, if you, you know, so that sort of thing can't happen now. Right. Like or rather, if that sort of thing happens, it happens with privacy. You have built in privacy. Right. So those are the benefits of input perturbation that, you know, if you decide to use your data later for some other purpose, you don't have access to the raw data anymore. Uh, what you are going to do is you have built in privacy for whatever else you decide to use it for. Okay. So, and that's kind of why a lot of the corporations uh, prefer, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, you know, basically any industrial application of differential privacy I know uses local differential privacy and uses input perturbation. And this is kind of the reason why. Okay. Okay. So let me, okay. So uh, coming back to output perturbation. Um, so for output perturbation, what you want to do is you are solving this kind of admin, right? So you're solving this minimization problem and uh, you want to add noise proportional to its sensitivity, right? So if you are doing non-private optimization, then you would get W star. Uh, if you are doing objective perturbation, then you can generate, uh, you know, you can do some vector analog of the Laplace mechanism or the Gaussian mechanism, right? So you can generate a d-dimensional analog of that and you can add noise, um, you know, you can add a linear term, uh, which is a vector analog of this Laplace mechanism, okay? And then if you solve, uh, and then your private uh, uh, optimization will solve this problem and it will give you, uh, you know, a private, uh, you know, a private output. And here uh, for objective perturbation, what, sorry, for uh, objective perturbation, what you need to do is you need to bound the sensitivity of the gradient, right? So now the gradient of your optimization would be minus B. So, uh, and solving this would give you uh, W private. So what you need to do is you have to bound the sensitivity of the gradient. And um, so, you know, if you can bound the sensitivity of the gradient, which you can do for a lot of problems like, um, uh, you know, which you can do for a lot of problems like, you know, 
for linear classification, for example, your randomness is calibrated to the sensitivity of the relevant output. And now your, and the reason why they work is that the performance theoretically depends on the analytical properties of the data domain, loss functions, and so on, but it empirically depends on, you know, the data set, okay? So you can, uh, so coming back, uh, what you do is in non-private optimization, you would have solved W star. For objective perturbation, you generate the vector analog of the Laplace mechanism. You add this noise term and you bound the sensitivity, uh, sorry, the sensitivity of the gradient. So then uh, what you would do is uh, what the theory tells you is that for input perturbation, uh, this would be kind of your, um, you know, this would be kind of uh, the extra, uh, loss, right? The, this would be kind of the extra loss that you would pay uh, due to privacy, okay? And the extra loss, again, is something like uh, square root D log uh, 1 over delta for epsilon uh, delta differential privacy uh, divided by N epsilon, okay? For output perturbation, uh, what you would get would be uh, D over N epsilon uh, to the uh, three halves. And for objective perturbation, what you would get would be D over N epsilon. Okay. So notice that, uh, again, you have this privacy accuracy sample size trade-off. So the loss is the extra loss. The higher the extra loss is, lower is your accuracy. But then again, this higher extra loss depends on one over N epsilon, right? So if N is large, this extra loss is low. Uh, so n is large, which means higher data, extra loss is low. If epsilon is small, which means high privacy, then this extra loss is high, right? Uh, and there are also various other things that are hidden in here. Uh, these are things like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, properties of the loss function, uh, like the, you know, lipschitzness, smoothness, what is your regularization parameter, and so on and so forth, okay? So empirically, how do things work? Uh, empirically, we find that, you know, of course, input perturbation um, is not that great. Um, in general, objective perturbation empirically seems to do better than output perturbation. And uh, Gaussian mechanism, you know, which is again, not, um, uh, you know, which is again, not surprising. Uh, and Gaussian mechanism with epsilon delta guarantees outperform Laplace mechanism with epsilon guarantees, again, which is also not super surprising. And also everything is very data set dependent, right? So, um, you know, uh, in machine learning, there are some harder data sets uh, and there are easier data sets and easier data sets, um, you know, again, they're also relatively easier for private machine learning and the harder data sets also, you know, this kind of private, even this privacy accuracy sample size trade-off is worse for harder data sets. Okay, so this is uh, what you get. And in general, there are also a lot of gaps between theory and practice. Um, you know, again, we don't know how to choose these uh, parameters. Given a data set, it's hard to tell, uh, you know, ahead of time what kind of trade-offs you would get. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, for general optimization problems or algorithms, it's uh, hard and, you know, there are also a lot of this kind of computational problems, okay? So uh, in summary, training does not on its own guarantee privacy. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different uh, ways. And what we talked about briefly was how to do this for um, a lot of the solutions. We talked about how to do this in one shot for, um, uh, you know, things like linear classification. Okay, and uh, and again, there is this kind of uh, privacy accuracy sample size trade-off. Okay, so this is kind of the summary for linear. Um, next, uh, so maybe I can, if there are any questions for this part, I can pause for a bit. Next, what I would be talking about is how to do these things for more complicated, um, you know, iterative, uh, you know, how, how to get privacy along with more complicated things like, uh, you know, deep learning, uh, where the idea is not to do this kind of one shot um, private optimization, but to do it in iterations or processes, uh, you know, in iterations, because most machine learning algorithms turn out to be iterative, how to do these for uh, more iterative machine learning algorithms.
Okay. So, um, so I guess uh, since there are no questions, we will uh, move ahead and talk about how to do these uh, things for uh, more challenging optimization problems and uh, more um, you know, iterative uh, sort of solutions, okay? So, so far what we have done is we have talked about kind of batch optimization, right? So we had this private data set, we got this W star and we added some noise or we got this kind of batch objective and then we added some noise to this objective and then we solved it, okay? For really large data sets or for even for more complex optimization problems like deep learning, these kinds of batch methods are not really feasible. Right. And in practice, what people do is, um, you know, they have more online methods. And, you know, another benefit of these more online methods is that they can also scale to larger data sets. Right. So even if you are doing linear classification, you can scale to larger data sets. And as we know that larger data sets are, uh, you know, are in fact, if anything, they're more desirable for privacy applications. OK, so how can we do this? Um, uh, you know, how can we do private learning in this sort of online form, right? Here, what we would do is instead of looking directly, you know, at this sort of one-shot learning processes, we would guarantee privacy uh, because we are using this kind of online optimization algorithm, okay? Uh, and in particular, the most common um, and, you know, kind of the most popular online algorithms, um, you know, optimization algorithms that are used is, uh, you know, what is called stochastic gradient descent. And it is actually, a, you know, a, a very popular method for, all, you know, in the optimization, but in machine learning, it's really very popular. Um, and the idea there is the following. The idea is that you are doing some kind of gradient descent, right? However, you are uh, not necessarily doing gradient descent on the entire, you know, you're not really doing gradient uh, descent with respect to the entire data set. You are picking a random data point and you are doing uh, gradient descent with respect to it, right? So there is already some noise built into the process. Uh, however, uh, even though there is already some noise built into the process, the result is not completely private. Right. So you do this iterate, uh, you, you need to do something more to preserve privacy. So what you want to do is you want to pick random data points, you add some noise to preserve privacy and you keep iterating. OK, so here is what uh, your uh, non private SDD looks like. What you would do is remember, this is our regularized risk. So this is our optimization objective. We want to minimize this. So what you would do is you would select a random data point. You would take a gradient, so, you know, uniformly from your data points, you would take a gradient step and then you would project back, you know, if you are doing, uh, you know, if you want to keep your, uh, you know, uh, you, if you want to keep your update within some kind of ball or within some kind of region, then you would project back, right? And you keep going, right? Uh, if you were doing this with noise, this is very easy to do with noise in fact and if you were doing this with noise what you would do is instead of taking you know you still select your random data point instead of uh, taking a gradient descent step with respect to this point what you would do is you would take a noisy gradient descent step right so you calculate whatever you were calculating you add noise to the gradient and you add enough noise that, you know, that uh, you can preserve privacy. You can use the global sensitivity method for this process if your gradients are bounded, which is the case for a lot of cases, uh, which is true in a lot of cases. So you get your noisy gradient and you project back, uh, you know, you take a noisy gradient step and you project back, okay? And, uh, you know, uh, how do you add this noise? Um, in a lot of cases, the noise, um, the sensitivity of the gradient is bounded, right? So especially if your, uh, if your gradients are, um, if your gradients are um, bounded themselves, which is true in a lot of cases, if they're not bounded, you can clip them, right? So you're, uh, you need to, uh, you can clip your gradients and then you just add noise. Um, if you want epsilon dp, then you can add noise, uh, you know, using uh, a high dimensional version of the Laplace mechanism. Um, if you are, if you are looking at, uh, you know, if you want epsilon delta differentially private, you can add noise, um, 
you know, with the high dimensional version of the Gaussian mechanism. And this noise has also has to be calibrated to the sensitivity of the gradient. But if your gradient is bounded, you can do that. And, um, and then, uh, and it also, you know, to some extent, it will depend on your loss function, but you, you can calculate this, and you can add this noise. And then, you know, you can have, um, you know, then you can uh, add noise to your gradient, and you can just keep going. Okay. So, so there are, uh, so, so what could happen over here? So when you add noise to the gradient, um, there are a couple of ways you could do this. You could, uh, you know, either go in the direction of the gradient with some probability or in the opposite direction. And that would give you a certain form of differential privacy that, you know, that, that was actually an algorithm due to Ducci et al. And, um, and there's some probability of going in the wrong direction. Uh, another way to do this is, uh, so the, these are the two alternative ways of doing it. One would be, you know, you add noise to the gradient and project back. The other would be with some probability you go along the gradient and with some probability you go opposite in the direction. And, you know, with both methods you would get DP. Um, and then, uh, you know, these both methods would work and they then they work more or less equally well uh, and uh, they both ensure unbiased estimate of the gradient uh, and give you convergence okay and um, and then uh, okay so they give you convergence and you know you would get uh, something out of this um, how can you but what would be the problem with this right so the problem with this would be that when you use this kind of differentially uh, uh, private, uh, you know, gradient descent, what would happen is because you are adding noise at every step, uh, you would end up adding a lot of noise, right? So you're trying to solve some optimization problem and, you know, in every step you're going down, but you are now you're not going down anymore, right? So you're now adding noise at every step. So, um, so what would happen is that, you know, ultimately you would converge, but your privacy accuracy, uh, you know, privacy accuracy sample size trade-off uh, will will uh, will suffer, and there are several things you can do to make it more practical. Uh, one way to do this is you can add more iterations, and that would be and typically what you would need would be about O of n square iterations. Uh, another solution is to use mini batching, and you know mini batching means that when you calculate the gradient, instead of taking one point, you take you know maybe ten or fifty points, right? And that also helps quite a bit. Uh, and the solution three that people use is um, better privacy analysis uh, to show that the privacy loss is not so bad, right? So these are kind of um, three different ways. Um, uh, what I will do next is um, I will talk a little bit about um, uh, how to use some of these uh, other ways. Okay. Okay. So uh, how can you amplify privacy? So I will not talk so much about mini batching. So the mini batching is just kind of obvious. Uh, I will talk a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, the better analysis, okay? So one of the things that you can do to amplify differential privacy is to uh, exploit the random sampling. Right. Uh, and, you know, remember um, what we were doing was uh, in uh, in stochastic gradient descent, what you were doing was that you were automatically, uh, you know, uh, using random sampling. Right. So in stochastic gradient descent, normally what you would do is you would pick, um, uh, you know, in its pure form, you would pick one random point and then you would take a, a stochastic, uh, you know, you would take a gradient descent step along it. If you were doing um, something more complicated, uh, you know, if you were doing something like mini batching, you would pick, you know, 10 random points or 50, right? And uh, maybe we can exploit this fact that this, uh, you know, that you already have some sort of, um, uh, so maybe this sampling by itself can give you some inherent privacy, okay? And uh, as it happens, it can, and we can do some extra privacy analysis to help. So if you were taking a random SAP sample of size gamma n, right? So gamma n, if gamma n was your batch size, 
right? Where gamma here is less than one, of course, because you are not using the entire data set. So if you were sampling gamma n entries of the data set uniformly at random, and if you were running your algorithm, then you would get two gamma epsilon differential privacy, right? So what you find is that normally you would get epsilon differential privacy. Now you're getting two gamma epsilon, right? So if especially, so if your gamma is much less than a half, then uh, this leads to privacy amplification, right? Because you're effective. Uh, so your privacy parameter becomes two gamma epsilon and you get a fair bit of privacy amplification, okay? So this random subsampling can help you amplify privacy, okay? Um, so to summarize, we talked about stochastic gradient descent, which can be made uh, differentially private in several ways by randomizing the gradient. Uh, the, if you keep the gradient estimates unbiased, can help ensure convergence. And then, um, you know, you, uh, you know, things like mini batching can help you and random subsampling can also help you amplify uh, data, uh, you know, this kind of privacy guarantees. Okay. So this was uh, the summary. Uh, maybe if there are questions uh, in the next step, I uh, will uh, very briefly talk about uh, how we can amplify privacy. And then uh, we will go ahead and uh, maybe look at some figures. Okay, so, uh, sorry, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead then. Um, okay, so uh, in the next, uh, maybe the next, uh, oh, this uh, seems to be a question. I see. So maybe what we can do, since there's not a lot of time left, maybe we can go ahead to some of the empirical results about the effect of choosing the methods on accuracy. So uh, there are uh, a whole bunch of empirical results. Um, in the first uh, uh, part that I talked about, there are empirical results that compare, uh, basically input perturbation doesn't work so well. Um, there are empirical results that you know uh, we did where we show that objective perturbation works better uh, than using output perturbation, and it's mostly because objective perturbation is exploiting uh, you know more properties of the data. Uh, in the SGT world, there are various empirical results, and basically, what the empirical results show is that um, uh, you know uh, what, what the empirical results show is uh, essentially um, uh, what the what the empirical results show is that uh, you know uh, essentially subsampling does help quite a bit if it is done properly. And then the second thing that I will be talking about is, you know, better composition management. And the empirical results show that they have, uh, you know, they, they, have a, they have a pretty strong effect. Okay. Uh, so maybe, maybe what we can do is um, uh, mention a little bit about the strong composition methods and then uh, maybe go directly to some of the empirical results. Uh, so maybe let me just do that. Okay. okay. So, uh, sorry, just uh, give me a second. Okay. So, so, so far we have talked about, um, uh, you know, in, in the beginning we talked about these properties like, um, uh, you know, post-processing invariance and composition, uh, which, were diff uh, which were various ways to do privacy accounting. Okay. And, um, and, you know, when we look at these highly iterative multi-stage methods, what happens is that this privacy accounting also becomes more complex, right? So more complex algorithms have multiple stages and each of these stages have to guarantee differential privacy. So how do we do privacy accounting, right? So, um, and so, um, 
sorry, so how do we do privacy accounting? So we talked about one of the ways of doing privacy accounting was post-processing invariance. Uh, the other way is to do composition, right? So we talked about uh, earlier how if you are using, you know, applying R algorithms, each with epsilon I, delta I differential privacy, the total privacy loss would be sum over I epsilon I, sum over I delta I. And this is in some sense the worst case analysis, right? And this becomes very important because if you have this kind of iterative algorithms like SGD, at each step you are doing some sort of, uh, you know, uh, some, some sort of privacy accounting, right? So you have some sort of total privacy loss and in each step you're doing some sort of privacy accounting, okay? Uh, and this is kind of the worst case. As it happens that we can also do much better privacy accounting and that gives us a better privacy uh, accuracy sample size trade-off. Okay? Uh, so, you know, normally what would happen is the total privacy loss would be sum over the privacy losses, but we can do, um, you know, we, we can do, uh, we can take a closer look at epsilon and delta and we can do uh, better privacy accounting. So what I will do is maybe give you a very quick idea of, uh, you know, what kind of things can help and then uh, we will go and look at some empirical results, okay? So uh, how, how can uh, do we do better privacy accounting? If you look at, uh, let's kind of go back to the very basics of the Gaussian mechanism, right? So if you look at the Gaussian mechanism, uh, remember in the Gaussian mechanism, what happened was that we were looking at, uh, you know, these kinds of density, uh, you know, these kind of log like uh, the likelihood ratios. And then we were also looking at tail. So we said, okay, if we don't talk about this tail, then this is the best log likelihood ratio that we can get, right? But if you add a certain amount of Gaussian noise, you can get an entire spectrum of epsilon delta guarantees. You could, you know, if you are looking at, you know, large deltas, you can get better and better epsilons, right? And in fact, uh, you know, so for example, uh, sorry, so, uh, you know, this will give you um, an epsilon delta guarantee. If you look at, you know, if you can get closer, then you will get a bigger delta, but you can also get a better epsilon, right? And as a result, we can look at this kind of privacy loss, not as one, you know, bound, but you can look at an entire spectrum. And by looking at it as an entire spectrum, what you could do is you could do a better and tighter analysis, right? And in fact, what is, uh, you know, what we can look at is what is called the privacy loss random variable, which is the log likelihood ratio and this log likelihood ratio takes, uh, is, this is the log likelihood of, you know, uh, the likelihood that probability of D is T versus probability of D prime is T. And this happens with probability, so this is an entire random variable. This happens with probability uh, A of D is T, right? And you can look at what is happening with this random variable and you can, you know, cut off at various points and you can get an entire trade-off. And by looking at this random variable, we can, you know, we can look at the moments of this random variable and we can do a more complicated analysis, okay? And that gives us something called, uh, you know, a strong composition bound or, uh, you know, something called the moments accountant, right? But we call the moments accountant, okay? And, uh, you know, uh, basically the idea is that if this, privacy loss random variable, if its maximum absolute value is epsilon, then you can get epsilon zero differential in privacy. But, uh, you know, but by looking at, uh, you know, by cutting it off at various different points, you can get more complicated, um, you know, you can get better bounds, right? And uh, the idea is to, you know, the challenge kind of is to reason over, uh, you know, sort of the worst case values. And what you can do is you can look at, you know, various moment generating functions of this random variable to look at these worst case values, okay? And that gives you something called the moments of content. So I won't go into the details of how this is done, uh, but let us look at uh, what we can get, okay? So here, is, um, you know, uh, we are looking at the, uh, on the x-axis, what we are plotting is rounds of composition, 
right? And in the y-axis, so this is the Gaussian mechanism. If you are composing very, uh, a lot of rounds of the Gaussian mechanism. In the x-axis, what you are plotting is rounds of composition. In the y-axis, what you're plotting is epsilon. So if we were looking at, and you know, delta is fixed, right? So if we were looking at, um, you know, kind of the very naive linear composition, this would be a straight line going up, right? And I'm not even plotting the straight line here because the straight line doesn't fit into this picture, right? It would go up very sharply out, right? So the straight line would be, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, at this, uh, at a certain slope and it would go up like this, okay? Okay. And so um, what does this figure tell you? As you go, uh, so, you know, as, as you increase the rounds of composition, more slowly, if your bound grows more slowly, then your privacy, you know, the privacy that you are getting out. Uh, so this is the same algorithm. So your accuracy, sample size, they are the same, right? But if your uh, things, you know, if, if this curve grows more slowly, then the privacy that you're getting out of it is higher. Uh, right? Because your epsilon is lower. So the privacy that you're getting out of it is higher, right? Low epsilon means high privacy. And as a result, your um, privacy accuracy sample size trade-off is better, right? So if you have a low curve, then you are getting more privacy for the same amount of, you know, accuracy per sample size, right? And so the linear is the worst. The linear should be above all of these lines. Uh, DRV10 was, you know, this was a method by uh, Dwork et al. Uh, that gave you something which was a little bit better than linear. And that is the white squares, right? So you're getting something better than linear already. And finally, moments accountant is the method that, uh, you know, that I just mentioned. There you are getting even much better than that, right? So this is kind of, you know, one of the almost close to the state of the art method for, uh, you know, for measuring composition. And if you use it, uh, so how does this work on real data? So here is um, an example of using this kind of uh, moments accountant method uh, for, uh, you know, EM on mixtures of Gaussians, right? With Gaussian mechanisms, right? And here what you can see is on the X axis, you have uh, privacy loss. And on the Y axis, you know, think about this as a measurement of test error. So this is test log likelihood. And what you see is, um, you know, the, uh, the um, light blue line is the moments accountant. Uh, the dark blue line is linear composition. And then um, the pink line and uh, uh, is uh, the advanced composition. This is the dark, uh, the DRV 10 thing that I just showed you. So what you can see is, you know, EM is again in yet another iterative method. And here what you can see is that you are getting a much better, um, you know, test log likelihood. So here your data size uh, set is fixed, right? Data size is fixed. The better test error that you get, the better is your privacy accuracy trade-off, right? So what you're plotting here is privacy accuracy trade-off um, with uh, data size set fixed. So as you can see, the better composition method you use, uh, the better accuracy that you can get for the same amount of privacy, okay? So this is uh, kind of a, a one of these empirical results, okay? I think there is a question on the chat. Aha, that's an excellent question. So Ord is asking uh, what happens when you try to do this kind of thing for anomaly detection? So generally for anomaly detection, doing it with privacy, uh, anomaly detection when the data is very imbalanced. So for things like anomaly detection, doing it with privacy is actually very, very hard. Uh, so these are for relatively balanced data sets. Doing it for imbalanced data sets gets, um, you know, it's, it's really quite tricky. Uh, there is some work, but I, you know, I honestly don't know of any anomaly detection solution uh, that works well with differential privacy. Okay. Okay. Uh, to, so to summarize, sorry, uh, let me just uh, stop. Uh, yeah. So to summarize, 
practical machine learning looks at data at uh, you know at many stages uh, of the process uh, post processing invariance helps quite a bit to help with the privacy and good composition method um, you know are also very helpful especially when you are looking at these kinds of iterative methods like differentially private uh, stochastic gradient and methods and here um, there are these advanced composition methods like the moments accountant uh, which can help you track the actual privacy loss more accurately and gives you uh, better privacy um, you know gives you better privacy guarantees and as a result it can give you better privacy accuracy uh, sample size trade-offs okay so uh, so with this I will stop and if there are uh, I can take some questions if there are uh, uh, any? Yes, so, so thank you so much, uh, Kamalika. Um, it's been really fascinating uh, for me. Um, we have time for, we have like two minutes. So I, I know our participants are a bit tired. Yeah, <laughs> um, um, but uh, I, I really uh, would like to hear a question or two. If not, I have one of my own. Uh, so uh, you can just raise your hands or again, write, write, write in the chat. Um, so uh, I'll ask from, um, from um, um, kind of a, a bit of a technical question. So uh, we know that, that, that Laplace and, and Gaussian noise work well in kind of the, you know, the, the basic, uh, default uh, differential privacy. But is the difference um, um, between the type of distribution you would use in uh, output and input perturbation? Um, so in uh, all of these cases, uh, the distribution is uh, essentially high dimensional versions of Laplace and Gaussian. Yeah. But then what differs is how do you calibrate? Uh, so what, what is the sensitivity? Uh, so in output perturbation, it will depend on, you know, the sensitivity of the optimizer. Um, and then that is, um, uh, depends on the problem, right? So for linear classifications, you can bound it directly. For deep learning, you can't directly bound it. Um, mm. Right. And then for, um, uh, so the sensitivity differs, but these are all Gaussian and Laplace mechanisms. Why, so is that can, yeah, yeah, just, just why, why can't you bound it? Um, so for um, things like deep learning, if you yeah. change one data point, things can change quite a bit because it's a very, you know, non-convex optimization process, mm -hmm. especially if you start from a point which is close to like a saddle point, you can go in either direction, uh, you know, based on, you know, one or two data points, things can change quite a lot. Okay. So, so that is the, why for yeah, things sorry. like these non-convex, you always use these uh, SGT based methods. Uh, so or has a question in the chat. Ah, uh, what about high dimensional correlations? Wouldn't the small perturbation? Yes, so it does impact the utility of the classifier quite a bit. That that definitely does happen. And this is kind of, um, you know, uh, one of the things where there is always a dimension dependence um, for differentially private learning, uh, or at least, you know, the ones that I, all the results that I have seen, there is essentially always a dimension dependence. So, you know, in like non-private machine learning, if let's say your data is, uh, let's say your data lies in a hundred dimensions, but your data actually lies in, let's say a 10 dimensional subspace, right? In non-private machine learning, it should be okay. But in differentially private machine learning, uh, you still have to add noise, which is proportional to 100. And uh, this kind of dependence on the extrinsic dimension will come in. So this is kind of one of the um, uh, disadvantages of differentially private machine learning. Uh, so that's, and, and in fact, one of the open challenges, because I, uh, I don't think people really know how to get around it. There are some ways of partially getting around it. If you know the data has some structure, if you have some prior knowledge, there's some stuff you can do, but uh, that's kind of the, the bad thing.
I'm on mute, of course. Um, so um, thank you so much, Kamalika. I think uh, it really opens up a really fascinating and, and, and really important field. I'm sure many of the people here will um, take a lot from it. And I, I pass, uh, I guess, the, I'll ask Or or uh, Ellie. Things up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, well, it was fun. Thank you. Very much. Yeah. Thank you. So this is the end of the third day. Tomorrow we will have another. Uh, tomorrow we start again at 10 Israel time, which means uh, 9 Europe, 8 London, uh, midnight, San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, and everybody knows to translate. Uh, uh, we will have a panel, and I sent in the chat earlier uh, a list of topics that you can see in the program. Uh, same Zoom link, so you are all welcome, and thank you again.